Good morning, folks. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith. And today we are going to talk about Israel's rejection of Jesus, the second part. This is the end, basically, of Romans chapter 10, which concludes like this. All day long, says God, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. He's referring to the Jews, the Jewish nation, Israel, not to the remnant, of course, which believed in Jesus. So here we go. The text says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. This is with a doubt, without a doubt the saddest story in history. God sent his son to Israel. They rejected him. And John chapter 1 verse 11 says this, He came to his own, and his own received him not. There was, as Paul writes, a remnant that believed in Jesus, though. And so John says again in John 1.12, But to those who received him, he gave, the, he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believed in his name. This rejection is unparalleled in history. Israel's story is really of a nation that rejected God although the Jews of Jesus' day denied it. <clears throat> Jesus warned the nation of the consequences of rejecting him, but they did not believe him. And disaster came upon them in AD 70 about, and once again in about AD 130, and eventually the Romans carried the Jews captive. And sowed, uh, tore down the city of Jerusalem and sowed the lands around it and Jerusalem with salt. So that there was no way they could come back. <clears throat> now Paul discusses the Jews' rejection at length. And John, in the book of Revelation, spends chapter after chapter on what's happening in and to Israel as well as to all the world. The business of what happens to Israel is also a major subject in the prophets of the Old Testament. And so Jesus says this in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. In, a, in prophesying what's going to happen in, uh, in AD 70 and 130, he says, And they, the Jewish nation, will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That's a very significant statement, because in 1948, Israel once again became a nation 
in partial fulfillment of the prophecy in Ezekiel 37. So it's happened. That means the end times are upon us and they are coming. And the stage is now being set for the final acts preceding Israel's redemption and their conversion to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it will be a time so terrible that Jesus said, except those days are shortened, no flesh would be saved. In other words, no humans would be alive. <clears throat> and this is referred to in scripture as the Great Tribulation and also similar terms as like the time of Jacob's trouble and so on. There is no indication that this will be an easy time for anyone. And we'll be talking much more about this later as we study Israel's place in the prophets and as we study the prophets themselves. So now the next section that Paul gives us is a digression. How does God communicate his word to lost people? And I'm not quite sure why Paul does this, but he did. And so we'll deal with it. So Paul says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How they sh shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace who bring glad tidings of good things. Folks, there is no substitute for preachers, however it is they preach, whether it's through personal ministry, one-on-one -on -one evangelism, in churches as pastors, as evangelists who go and speak to crowds on social media. There is no substitute for men and women who preach the gospel. <clears throat> and God has ordained that in this age, his message comes through people whom he has called to that work. Very important to understand, God is not going to send angels, except in specific and special circumstances, to preach the gospel. He has called you and me. Now, God does sometimes also call people through personal messages to them in that he appears in dreams and visions and in other ways, but that is not the main way. The main way is in fulfillment of Jesus' great commission, which he gave to his servants after his resurrection. He spoke this five times in different ways, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. And here is what he said to the disciples in Acts. It says, he said to them, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. It's like the Holy Spirit came on the disciples that were there, the 120 that were there, and it then suddenly ripples began to ripple out throughout Jerusalem, then throughout Judea and Samaria, and finally to the ends of the earth, because God has planned that his gospel, that the gospel of Jesus Christ, go everywhere. <clears throat> and those who are dedicated to fulfilling it are special people. Now, God calls and sends his servants to people who do not yet know him. Like we read in Acts chapter 13, it, it says there, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, that is actually Paul, who changed his name later, or Luke changed it, to <clears throat> minister to the Gentiles and kind of relieve himself of that Jewishness. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having laid, fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Very, very important passage. 
This is the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey when he went to the Gentiles rather than the Jews. To be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the highest and holiest calling on earth. And as I've meditated on this, uh, there's one thing I don't understand, and that's why he would call me. Why me? And if you are ever called of God in the same way, you'll be asking yourself the same question because you know you. You know your sinful heart. You know your problems. You know everything about you. But God calls men and women, sinful, weak men and women, to do his work. That call may demand extreme sacrifice. <clears throat> and Satan fights against every preacher whom God calls, <clears throat> trying to destroy him or her, trying to prevent them from fulfilling their mission. <clears throat> and I even remember reading that during the Moravian revival in Germany, which occurred in 1700s, Prior, actually, to the Wesleyan Revival was the Moravian Revival. Young men were called to the Gold Coast of Africa to preach there. Now, life expectancy there was six months. So those young men didn't say, no, I won't go. I'm only going to live six months. What good can I do there? Those young men had their caskets shipped with them because they never expected to return home. And folks, those who answer this call, the call to preach the gospel, sign up for whatever, whatever the Lord calls them to do. That's why I am doing this. Wherever and whenever he calls them to do it. And if and when you receive such a call, it will be a general call. You won't have a right to choose where you will serve. You will serve where God sends you. Moreover, it's a call for life. It does not end until you are with the Lord in heaven. <clears throat> As Paul wrote, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. If you fall, if you fail, you can come back and he will recall you. The call to preach the gospel can come at any time in life. You may be 18, 19 as I was. You may be 60, 70, 80, 90. It can come in any way he chooses. And if you're called, you will know. Believe me, God comes to you personally and says, I want you. I know because it happened to me. If you're called, you're going to know it. But when you are called, keep eternity in mind because the life that we live now is not necessarily pleasurable if you're called to preach the gospel. As Paul wrote to Timothy, therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And in Matthew chapter 19, Peter actually asks Jesus the question, what about us? Peter answered and said to him, behold, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to him, them, the apostles, and listen carefully to exactly what he says. Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, in other words, everything you're going to get, really get, is in the future. You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones. And of course, he's referring to the apostles here, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, all that's possible. For my namesake, 
shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. If you get your reward here, that's all there is. But you're going to get your reward there if God calls you to preach the gospel and you answer that call. You will get your reward in eternity. And if you're called to preach the gospel, you may be prominent like Billy Graham was, or you may not. You may have an easy life or a hard life, but your reward is not here. Your reward comes on resurrection morning. As Gabriel said to Daniel in the book of Daniel at the end, in Daniel 12, Gabriel says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then he says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the highest and holiest calling on earth. And if God calls you, listen and obey. Now, we got to go back to the Jews because that's Paul's main subject. And what he said here was a digression. <clears throat> so Paul writes, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. He's referring to the conversion of the Gentiles. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. And folks, that's about us, the Gentiles. I never asked to know Jesus. He called me. He came to me and he said, I want you. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Now, folks, this is the saddest story ever told, that God would send his son to his own, very own chosen people and that they would reject him. That rejection, however, is not permanent, as the Old Testament makes very, very clear. And the New Testament does as well, especially in the book of Revelation, as we'll see. Now, the story is not over, and we're going to see this in Romans 11 and throughout the Old Testament prophecies about this and in Jesus' teachings throughout the Bible, throughout the whole Bible, the Jews are a nation that will return. The Jews are going to be once again the head and not the tail. The Bible says so. Now, terrible things are yet to happen both to the nation of Israel and also to the Gentile world because as a whole, the world rejects Jesus Christ and only a remnant believes. The rest turn aside after Satan despite God's call and invitation. The rejection of the Jews issues in the end times, which we're in now, the tribulation, Armageddon, the kingdom, then the final judgment and the new heaven and the new earth. Folks, it's coming whether you accept it or not. This is as inevitable as the first coming of Jesus Christ. It's in, as inevitable as a sunrise, as a sunset, as winter and summer. <clears throat> it's happening. It's going to happen. Ezekiel 37 makes it very, very clear what will happen. And folks, it's coming much sooner than you think. Jesus said this to his disciples. At the end of his 
Sermon on the Mount of Olives, which is about his return, he says, what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Don't be fooled. Jesus' return will come as a surprise. And once those events begin, they cannot be stopped. Nothing will stop them. And this is a word to those of my friends who are of the Islamic faith. Jesus is Lord. The Jews are God's chosen people. You cannot change that. Even if you make every effort to destroy the nation of Israel. And I say to you, if you do not believe me, read Ezekiel 37 and especially Ezekiel 38. You will find there that God protects his people. Even if they cannot protect themselves. Jesus is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also who crucified him, and every tribe on earth shall wail because of him. Unless, of course, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, because then every hope you've ever had for your life will be fulfilled forever and ever. You will not be sorry when you turn to the Lord. It may be hard now, but you will live before him forever in the resurrection. God bless you. This is Steve Bradley, God's wordsmith, signing off for now.